Can you do maths in a crowd? So human beings are social animals. Even mathematicians are social animals, okay. despite rumours to the contrary. And when we make decisions, we rarely make decisions on something which affects us alone. We usually make decisions on the way uh, that we are going to interact with many other individuals. So they could be individuals in a crowd like this, or they could be just individuals in a society which are going to influence our behaviour. Um, so there's many examples of where we might want to consider how collectively human beings behave. So in 2012, I was part of quite a big team of mathematicians that were looking at the dynamics of the crowds. Um, in particular, I was looking at this bit here, uh, which is Portland Bill, and we were looking at how crowds could get in and out because all of the sailing events were in Weymouth in the bay there. So we were looking at how you'd manage traffic flow in and out of uh, the Portland Bill Peninsula. In 2014, uh, 2013, it was the 150th anniversary of London Underground, and whilst that was happening, I was one of the consultants. Um, London Underground have mathematicians that work for them, um, and we look at how crowds move around and how you can optimise the um, underground network so the crowds move um, freely. Um, pilgrimages, so there are many uh, sites of pilgrim, pilgrimage where huge numbers of people come, huge numbers, and those crowds have to be managed very carefully to make sure they're safe. Every so often you hear incidents of crowds stampeding and hurting each other, and that can be controlled with good management. Um, and recently, I was at a conference. It was a conference on uh, the effects of climate change on various things. I was there in the rather unglamorous role because I'm doing some work on bogs and how they're affected by climate change. Um, but someone else said, I'm here to model Dorset. I said, which bit of Dorset? He said, all of Dorset. Um, and he's trying to see the way that climate change will affect tourism in Dorset. So these are just a few of the many and varied possibilities of trying to understand how crowds move and how they behave. So the question is, can mathematics, my subject, make any sense? Is it useful in the sense of explaining collective behaviour? Is this a useful thing to do or are we just wasting our time? So... Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, I was very keen on science fiction. Well, I still am. Um, one of the books that I loved reading was the Foundation series uh, by Isaac Asimov. And Asimov was incredibly prescient. He, he uh, writing in the 40s and 50s, had a very clear vision of a lot of what's going on now. For example, he reasonably accurately described something which looks rather like the internet, and he wrote very much on robots. And one of the things he wrote about in the Foundation series was about a mathematician called Harry Seldon, one of the great fictional mathematicians, along there with Moriarty. Um, and Harry Seldon has developed mathematics to such a, a precision that he could predict the fate of entire civilizations. Okay, so, um, and he, he had this sort of uh, math he called psychohistory, and by solving these equations he could work out things, what uh, people would do. Well, that is science fiction. We can't do that. I can't predict what uh, the effect of anything really is. Um, but we can use mathematics to gain insights into human behaviour if there are enough human beings and they interact in a sort of quasi-random way. Um, we can't predict what an individual will do, but we can predict, to a certain extent, what people will do collectively in something like a crowd. What we can't do is what Asimov did, which was to try to predict what entire civilizations will do. And that's kind of what I want to talk about in this talk, um, how we can predict collective behavior of groups of individuals which all interact with each other. Um, and the reason 
we can do this is um, a thing called emergence. Emergence. So I want you to have a look at this, this picture here, which individually looks like a load of dots. Okay, individually it looks like a load of dots. But if you look at it sort of for long enough, I hope you can see a picture is emerging. Can anyone see a picture there? It's a Dalmatian, okay? There's a Dalmatian emerging from all of the dots. One of my ambitions in life is to have a Dalmatian and call it Spot, okay? It's sort of <laughs> simplify my life. I've actually got a Spaniel who's completely mad. Okay, so we see a pattern emerging from the way the dots all interact with each other. Now, this is an exercise in psychology, but it's really emphasising an actual phenomenon, the phenomenon that if you have what we call a complex system, and a complex system is something where you have lots of individual bits all interacting with each other, then you can get behaviour, collective behaviour, which emerges from that complex system, which is as a result of the interactions of the individuals rather than the individual behaviour. Okay, so collectively you get this emergent behaviour which is often simpler and easier to understand than the macroscopic behaviour of the individuals. And this gives us the kind of the hint that we might be able to understand how a crowd behaves even if we can't predict what individual human beings in that crowd do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give some examples of emergent behaviour in various uh, different areas of um, real, the real world. Then we'll look at some of the maths behind we un how we understand that emergent behaviour. And then I'll go on to the example of looking at crowds and we'll look at some animations of mathematical models for crowds. So one of my favourite examples of emergent behaviour is the M25. Okay, some of you may have used the M25 today. Some of you may be using other motorways. Okay, now I know that the default condition of the M25 is completely stationary behaviour, uh, which is fairly dull, um, especially if you're in it. But there's a phenomenon which um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, which is you driving along a motorway um, and the cars in front of you slow down, so you slow down, and eventually you come to a stop and after you've waited for a little while the cars in front of you accelerate and you accelerate and you drive along and you can't see any reason for what's happening and then they slow down and stop again and you stop and then you speed up and you go through what we call phantom traffic jams. Phantom traffic jams. And there's no obvious reason for them at all. Okay, you, you see no roadworks, no leaves on the road or whatever, uh, no stray animals, it's just there. And what you're seeing here is an emergent behaviour. And essentially what's happening is if you get a car traffic above a certain density, then if one car slows down for any reason at all, they may just feel psychologically they're getting too close to the car in front, so they slow down, and then the car behind them slows down, and the car behind them slows down, and that all kind of accumulates, and eventually you stop. And then the car that originally slowed down speeds off again, and then everyone else follows, and then that um, goes away. And what you get are these things we call shock waves, which travel back through the traffic, and regardless of the fact that the individuals in the cars are hugely complex, wonderful human beings who have a rich and varied social life, um, we can fairly accurately predict how likely these sort of waves are going to happen and the shock waves. And a lot of work's been done on understanding that. And then that work actually feeds into uh, the N25 with the variable speed limits as they're changed as you go around there. They're trying to kind of reduce uh, the bunching of the traffic to avoid it. So that's an emergent behaviour. Here's another example of a beautiful example of emergent behaviour. Um, the snowflake. So this gets me every time. Um, I never lose my sense of wonder when I look at a snowflake. 
because this is a sort of a smallish thing, and yet it has enormous beauty in it. No one can deny that that snowflake has great beauty. But what really gets me is that the snowflake is formed by water slowly freezing. Um, it freezes up in the atmosphere, and the water molecules are much, much smaller than the size of a snowflake. I know a snowflake is quite small, but the water molecules are much smaller. Um, and yet, we have this six-fold pattern of great beauty, which is emerging from the complex interactions of all of those um, molecules on a much smaller scale. And something which, you know, is a source of continual wonder to me is how the molecules over here know they've got to do the same thing as the molecules over there. And it's all to do with the way, as I say, that, that these patterns are emerging from these complex interactions. We're going to see things which look quite like snowflakes later on when we do some mathematics. So that's a very small scale emergence. If you want to go rather bigger, we have a galaxy. So there's the uh, Whirlpool galaxy. And of course, in a galaxy, you have uh, billions of stars uh, which interact through gravitational interaction, uh, uh, described by Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, and again, you've got these local interactions, uh, uh, gravitational interactions, which somehow all combine to produce emergent patterns. So the emergent pattern here is this superb spiral here. And no one can look at that and think there isn't some mechanism operating in the universe to produce that pattern. Okay, and that mechanism, I would say, is, is that of mathematics. Um, so we can, we can understand this spiral um, and the sort of shapes you get much more easily than we can understand the individual interactions of the stars. So again, this is a, an emergent behaviour, an emergent behaviour. Um, here's a lovely one that you get typically uh, uh, in the spring, i.e. now and in autumn, when starlings are on the loose, flying around. Uh, I wanted to show you a film here, but as, as my film is 120 megabytes of film, uh, I decided... I'll just show you a picture and I'll show you some animations later on. But, but I, can I um, commend you if you have the opportunity to go out with a camera where there are starlings and watch them. So a murmuration of starlings is here we have lots and lots of individual birds who are all interacting with their neighbours. They're interacting uh, with certain rules and I'll talk about those rules a bit later on. Um, and generally, a starling over here isn't that keen or interested in what a starling's doing over there, but by the interaction of these local rules, we get this collective behaviour emerging where the flock of starlings behaves almost like a single organism. And the reason it does that is mostly to deter predators. So when a, a, a hawk is faced with something like this, behaving like a big organism, um, it gets confused and um, uh, essentially uh, frightened by what's going on. So that's a murmuration of starlings. Do go and watch it if you haven't seen one already. Uh, very similar behaviour, uh, for very similar reasons, um, is found in a fish when they shoal. So here is a thing called a fish ball. Uh, we have some predators over here, and these are herrings, um, and the herrings collectively interact to form this sort of swirling thing, again, almost like a, uh, a, a single animal. That collective behaviour is very, very strong. Um, and, and it's fine and will deter predators like that. Unfortunately, it's pretty useless against a whale with a big mouth that eats the lot in one go. OK. Um, Here's one of my favourite examples of collective behaviour. So again, a, a, a shoal and a flock is quite large. Um, but I've spent uh, quite a chunk of my life studying a rather more humble thing, which is slime. OK. Um, and this is a thing called dictostelium, one of my favourite things, um, which is slime. It's, it's uh, small cells which interact. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how they interact in the next slide. Um, and individually, they behave, uh, they interact with certain rules. Collectively, we get this beautiful behaviour which emerges from that. Um, these are called scroll waves. Um, and uh, you can predict these patterns from the formulae I shall give in a minute. Um, and uh, again, I think it's wonderful that, that these cells organise themselves into these beautiful patterns um, by their interactions with their neighbours. Okay. So the next slide's mathematically heavy. I put it in because I've worked in this subject, so I thought you might as well see what I do when I'm doing mathematics. Um, so there we are. Um, what's happening in slime mould is what we're seeing here is cells with a certain density, um, and the cells release chemicals. And the chemicals diffuse through this medium. Uh, again, if I was to open a bottle of perfume here, the perfume would diffuse, so you would eventually hit, smell it at the back of the room. As the chemicals diffuse, so uh, other cells um, react to those chemicals and move in what we call the, the gradient of increasing chemical uh, uh, strength, and uh, that helps the whole thing clump, clump, clump all together. Um, so the slime mould's density U release chemicals concentration V, they diffuse, the cells move in the direction of increasing chemical um, uh, strength. Um, you can then write down what we call partial differential equations to describe all that. Um, and these are the equations which were derived by a wonderful mathematician called uh, Joe Keller uh, back in the 1970s. Um, and then if you solve these, you find those beautiful patterns coming out of that. So those patterns are coming from the interaction of the cells with these chemicals, and those chemicals react with the cells in a sort of feedback mechanism. Um, and, and then again, then we come up with these sort of equations which you can study. Um, another example of emergent behaviour in biological systems comes from solving equations really quite similar to these, what we call reaction diffusion equations. Um, and these were studied by no lesser man than Alan Turing. Now, if you've been following this series, we already heard about Alan Turing twice. Uh, once when we talked about um, the uh, invention of the computer, and another time when we talked about uh, chess playing, both of which he was incredibly um, proficient at. Well, not playing chess, but designing computers to play chess. What is less known about Turing is that after the war, he spent a lot of time thinking very hard about biological phenomena and why you get certain biological phenomena. Um, and he wrote down equations um, for the sort of cells um, and colours um, in animal coats and the way they all interact. Um, and he was able to uh, solve those equations in certain uh, contexts and he found patterns that emerged from them. So again, in, in an animal coat, you've got cells of different uh, pigments interacting with chemicals and something like that. And yet, large-scale patterns emerge from those. And um, we now call these patterns Turing patterns, uh, in honour of Turing's work. Um, and he correctly predicted um, that animals could have stripe patterns or, or spotty patterns or various other types of pattern. So these things here are essentially emerging from the equations which uh, arise by studying how these cells in the, in the coats all interact with each other. And they are what we call reaction diffusion equations, which combine uh, chemical reactions with how they diffuse through the medium. Um, Turing started all this off again in the 1940s. Um, it's led to a whole um, new subject, the subject we call mathematical biology. And uh, one of the main textbooks in that was written by uh, an old friend of mine, Jim Murray. Uh, when I was a student at Cambridge, he was uh, at Oxford. He was a professor there. Um, and Murray um, studied how different animals can get different types of coat pattern. Um, and he came up with a very important result, which is now called Murray's theorem, uh, which has various mathematical expressions, but 
um, can also be put into the following phrase, um, spotty animals can have striped tails, but striped animals can't have spotty tails. <laughs> okay. um, proof, there we are, um, a spotty animal with a striped tail. And, and the way uh, Murray uh, showed this was to do with the way chemicals diffuse, and basically you've got more um, space for them to diffuse on the body than you have on the tail, and so if the chemicals are a certain type, they will diffuse out on the body in one way to give you spots, and on the tail in another way to give you stripes. And that's how you can predict collective behaviour from this individual interactions. So I challenge you to go out there and find me a striped animal with a spotty tail. If you find one, photograph it and send it to me, and I will um, amend this lecture as a result. Uh, but I've yet to see one. There's plenty of spotty animals with spotty tails, and there's plenty of striped animals with striped tails, and there's spotty animals with striped tails, but we don't have striped animals with spotty tails. Okay. So um, this is the sort of behaviour that we expect to see. So emergence became very, very fashionable. Very, very fashionable. Um, and a lot of essentially nonsense started being written about it. So I've shown you examples of systems where... Um, small-scale interactions lead to ordered collective behaviour. Um, and then in the sort of 1980s and 1990s, um, this kind of became almost a cottage industry, um, and st somewhat extravagant claims started to be made for it, claims which I'm not going to make for it myself, but claims that if you have any system which, where things interact, that um, order will always emerge. Um, and here's a sort of picture of, I took from one of these books to sort of illustrate. There we are, local relationships, complex adaptive behaviour, blah, 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 blah. All that sort of stuff. Um, the answer to this is sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. And when it works, we, are, we kind of sort of understand the reasons. Um, but it was claimed that interactions, you'd have to, you could do away with managers because people just self-organise. You could do away with any sort of organisation, people just do themselves. Um, and the consciousness would sort of emerge as well. Um, we've been studying complex systems a lot more carefully since these claims were made, um, and those studies show that whilst you can often get patterns emerging, it's certainly not always the case. There's the second law of thermodynamics, which comes in and, and likes to create disorder if left to itself. Um, so please don't take away the idea from this lecture that emergence explains everything. It doesn't. But it, it does explain quite a lot of, of the sort of phenomena that we see in the natural world. OK. So, uh, what sort of patterns are we likely to see? Um, well, there's a, another branch of mathematics, a very closely related branch, again, one I work in myself a lot, called the theory of dynamical systems, um, which tries to classify the sort of patterns that you are likely to see in uh, a general system. Um, and some of the most common patterns that you see are what we call periodic or repeating patterns. Here's a photo I took recently. I was driving along and saw this wonderful, this is called a Kelvin Helmholtz wave in the sky. It's an absolutely beautiful example of a repeating pattern. Again, how on earth do the molecules in that cloud know what those ones are doing? Um, the pattern is emerging with this sort of wonderful shape here. Um, and uh, another thing that we now realise is even systems which are apparently disordered can often have deep uh, structure underneath. We call this uh, chaos, and um, we now understand there's a lot of even uh, apparently disordered things are actually organised at a deeper level. A deeper level. Um, and if you wish, come to the first lecture of the next series in October, and I'll tell you all about chaos theory. Okay, all about chaos theory. Um, and, and why these sort of patterns arise and why they are important. Okay. So that's kind of set the scene a bit. That, that kind of shows the background um, for the sort of emergent patterns that we see in natural phenomena. Um, and I want to kind of give you some idea as to how we go about studying these and uh, investigating them. Uh, and I'll, I don't want to go too heavily in the maths. Some of the maths can be fairly scary, 
with these differential equations. But it turns out there's actually a very nice way of studying them without going into too technical math, stuff which is relatively easy just to do on a pencil and paper calculation. Um, and I want to tell you about things called cellular automata, or CAs for short, cellular automata. So these are a wonderful tool for studying the sort of patterns that you get in complex systems. Um, like much of modern mathematics, uh, these were originally invented by von Neumann, along with the computer, fluid mechanics, many other things. Von Neumann did an enormous amount, uh, working with Stanislav Ulam in the 1940s at Los Alamos Labs. And they were popularised a great deal in the 1980s by Steve Wolfram, who uh, was the creator of Mathematica, which is a computer software package that some of you may have used. So what's the idea of a cellular automata? Well, we're not going to try to describe the complete rules of a crowd or, or bacteria or anything like that at this stage. We just think of um, a, a system as being composed of a number of cells. Um, not biological cells, just mathematical cells. So here's an example. You've got a load of cells in a hexagonal lattice. Some are grey, some are white, some are black. So these represent different states of the cell different states. Um, and the idea is that you go from one generation to the next, and each generation you update the state of a cell. You update the state of a cell. So you would update it from white. It could stay white, it would become black, or it could become grey. And then you have rules for how those states update, and usually the rules will um, be uh, dependent on what neighbouring cells are doing. So the rule could be um, if you have a white cell and it has a grey cell next to it, then on the next generation it becomes a black cell. Okay, that's a possible rule. I'm not going to go into rules in detail for this. We'll come into rules in a minute. But that's the idea. So you have a, a generation with things in a certain state and then you have a simple rule which updates it from one generation to the next. So we'll have a look at some examples now of cellular automata, and I want to show you that even very simple rules put into this framework can give us very complex patterns, and then those patterns can be used to help us understand the real world. So here's about the simplest uh, rule you can get. We're going to have what we call a one-dimensional cellular automaton, where uh, we have a set of cells, which is our first generation, in a row, like this, a one-dimensional line uh, in, with the values in lowercase. And then we'll have a rule which updates this um, to give you the um, uh, values in the next generation. That's our second generation, which I will indicate by that red line, telling us how we go from one generation to the next. Um, and here's a very simple rule. Uh, we'll call it the averaging rule, where we keep the, the values at the ends, always the same, so A goes to A, E goes to E, um, but to get this value here, I just take the average of the three above. And the three above gives me that one, the three above gives me that one. Okay, so this is just averaging. Um, and there's the rule, and what happens in this case is if you apply that rule over many generations, uh, a simple pattern emerges. And the pattern is that um, the values increase uniformly by steps of x from the left to the right. And it doesn't matter how you start the thing off, if you apply that rule enough, that simple pattern emerges. So that's an example of a system where a simple pattern emerges. Mathematically, this is very similar to the phenomenon of diffusion I described earlier. Here's another rule, it's a rather more complicated rule. Uh, again, I apply this, this to my generation um, um, going downwards. And this is called the X or rule, which is well known to produce uh, complicated behaviour. And the X or rule says that if I have uh, two cells, uh, one uh, separated by one, so uh, imagine I want to know what that one changes to, I look at the two cells either side. Um, if they are the same, I replace that one by a zero. And if they're different, 
I replace it by a 1. Okay, so that's XOR. It's called the ex uh, exclusive OR. Um, and it's a very commonly used operation in computer science. Um, and if you do exclusive OR on this, you get really quite uh, complicated patterns. It's very hard to see what's going on uh, just over a few generations. So um, the averaging rule gives you simple patterns, exclusive OR gives you more complicated ones. Um, it's difficult to see what's going on with numbers, so I want to tell you, show you more what's going to go on with pictures. And now I'm going to uh, talk about mostly work by Steve Wolfram. So Steve Wolfram wrote a book called uh, A New Kind of Science, in which he made some quite interesting claims for cellular automata, uh, essentially almost claiming they had consciousness, as far as I could tell. Um, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it's not much of an exaggeration. But it's well worth reading. It's, it's, um, he, he talks about cellular automata and all the types of patterns that it can have. Um, and in his book, he gives um, many very interesting examples of one-dimensional cellular automata. And this is one of his favourite. It's called Rule 30. Um, so again, the generations are going downwards in this way. Um, and the rule is in, described by these pictures up here. So if you have three blacks, then the one underneath to the middle goes to white, two blacks and a white goes to white, two blacks goes to white, and so on. I hope the rule is reasonably easy to, to, to sort of see what's going on. And that can be, you can do that on graph paper or you can implement it on a computer. Um, if you apply that rule to a start, which is all white, one black and all white, this is the pattern that starts to emerge from operating that rule from one generation to the next. Um, so it's a bit hard to see what's, what's going on until you look at lots of generations. And this is what happens if you apply that rule over um, hundreds of generations, you get this pattern here. And that pattern is produced just by this simple rule operating over and over again. Um, and it's really rather beautiful. There's a lot of different structures that you can see in this. Um, on the left, we have a repeating pattern. So this is fairly dull. Um, that repeating pattern starts to break up. And over here, we have really quite uh, an irregular pattern. Uh, this is one of my chaotic patterns where we're seeing all sorts of structure coming out. So on the left, very ordered, we go through a transition, disordered on the right. So that's Wolfram's rule 30. Here's another one of his rules, rule 150. Uh, so um, there we go. Um, there aren't that many rules that you can have because of the essentially how many ways you can choose blacks and whites over here. But here's his rule 150. Um, and again, we're going to apply that to this. You can possibly see that that seems to be producing something a bit more regular. Um, and if you apply that one over and over again, you get this beautiful pattern here. That's starting to resemble our snowflake. Okay. Uh, so if we imagine the snowflake operates where uh, the molecules in a local neighborhood interact with each other in a certain ordered way, and then you get this global pattern emerging, that's sort of what's happening here. Um, so the behavior is, is sort of periodic. If you see, we've got th this structure, and then the same structure repeats going down. Um, it's also what we call self-similar, that you get this pattern, and you get a much bigger version of that pattern, or you get a much smaller version of the pattern. You, you see the same pattern on different scales. Um, and this is an example of what we call a fractal. And in my next lecture on chaos theory, I'll talk a lot more about fractals. But the point of this is to say that this sort of simple rule from one generation to another, um, where things are just interacting locally, according to this, produces this really rather elegant structure. Um, another example, some of you may have come across Pascal's triangle. Um, Pascal's triangle is all to do with probability and stuff like that. 
Um, if you don't know about it, don't worry, but if you have come across it, colour in the even values, no, the odd values, and put the even values to be white, and you get this picture here. Um, and this is an example of exclusive or, the same map that we had this time, but this is where you have an offset grid so that uh, you offset uh, each one cell by half a cell from one generation to the next so that um, the value of a cell is just formed by the exclusive or of the ones above it and below it, uh, above it uh, to left and right. Um, or as I say, if you get Pascal's triangle and colour and the odd numbers, you get this same thing. Again, this beautiful pattern starting to emerge from that simple, simple rule. Again, you've got this cell similarity, you've got this triangle here, gives you that triangle there if you expand it, and you get the same thing on a smaller scale. So these cellular automata are really fun things to play with. I mean, the mathematical operations are quite simple, and yet the patterns are very beautiful. Um, and the great thing is, you see them in nature. So this is the Conus textile shell. Um, that's the pattern that forms on the shell of that, um, which looks very, very similar to the sort of patterns that we had in these cellular automata, and uh, possibly is driven by similar mechanisms. It's a bit hard to tell, really. OK, so those are one-dimensional automata. Um, we can go up a dimension and look at two-dimensional ones. So in a two-dimensional system, you have a grid, something like this. Um, well, let's, let's take this one. This is uh, the one that von Neumann studied. Um, and in the grid, you take um, a cell, which is indicated here by black, um, and you take a number of neighbouring cells, which are indicated by, in this case, the grey, um, different types of structure for the different examples. And for some uh, rule applied to the grey cells, you update the black cell. And you do all the cells simultaneously to go from one generation to the next. And that's called a two-dimensional automata. Um, invented by Neumann, uh, essentially were a subject of academic interest for a few years. Um, and then a guy called John Conway, who was one of my lecturers at Cambridge, I'm proud to say, um, came up with a particular set of rules, which he called the game of life. Okay, the game of life. Uh, there's Conway. Um, he now lives in Princeton, uh, but he was at Cambridge. Um, and he came up with the game of life, which has the following rules. Um, any live cell, so live cell we're indicate by black, and a dead cell by white, um, you'll consider a cell to be surrounded by neighbours, uh, indicated in grey, um, so if you have less than two live neighbours, uh, you feel lonely and you die. Um, if you have uh, two or three neighbours, you're fine, you carry on. Um, if you have more than three neighbours, um, then you're overcrowded, they use up all the resources and you die. Um, but if you have exactly three live neighbours and you're dead, then the idea is those neighbours get busy and produce more cells. And, and, and you come back to life. So this was sort of Conway's model for how uh, some sort of population of actual biological cells might go on from one generation to the next. Um, why, why did this become popular? It became popular for two reasons. Uh, one reason was that in 1970, the, the very great Martin Gardner, who wrote a, 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 a um, column every month in Scientific American called Mathematical Games, um, wrote a whole article about the game of life. Okay. The other reason, it, well, okay, he wrote a game of life and showed how you could sort of play with it even if you weren't particularly mathematically uh, gifted. You could look at the sort of patterns by essentially colouring in or implement them on, on computers, which were powerful enough in 1970 to do that. Um, the other reason it became so popular is that it has, like many bits of mathematics, simple to describe, but very, very, very rich types of structure. 
Um, these are three of the patterns that Conway's Game of Life um, comes up with as stable patterns. If you start with something fairly random, then after a while, patterns like this start to emerge. Okay, start to emerge. So see, here are some of Conway's patterns, which sort of start to look like living things. Um, are um, do um, an animation now of, of um, a set of these patterns. This, this is, um, again, uh, one of his things. This is called the glider gun. Um, and this is interesting because it's an example of a self-reproducing pattern. So we're just seeing one generation going on to another, going on to another, going on to another. Um, up here we have various things going on which are producing these things here which are called gliders which uh, go off and travel on forever and ever and ever. Um, and it is basically like it's reproducing itself. We are today of course celebrating the birth of a royal baby. Um, here's the birth of a glider. Okay. Uh, at least this has got a name. Okay, so, um, and people got very excited in this because, you know, here is something which reproduces itself. Hey, that's, that's kind of, isn't that what life does? Um, and it's called the game of life. So um, that's the glider gun. Um, and here's some other examples. This is, again, going through 30 generations or something else. And you can see how the patterns change and evolve. So there's a glider going down. Here's something which is repeating itself um, until the glider hits it, and then something else happens. Okay, so uh, um, there we have the game of life, a two-dimensional serial automata which starts to resemble maybe the way living organisms work. But it's not a coincidence that these things uh, do that, because actually um, uh, von Neumann, when he uh, created cellular automata, was trying to reproduce the way things uh, work in nature. And these are uh, used as practical tools now by biologists or mathematical biologists to look at things like um, the way bacteria are, uh, interact with immune cells. So um, I won't go into any detail, but here is a two-dimensional cell error automata, which is uh, kind of carefully designed to reproduce the way that uh, and your immune system and bacteria interact. And that will go on and evolve, and you can test various things. OK, so that's cellular automata. Um, this lecture is all about crowds, and we need to do something slightly more to understand a crowd. We need to take um, a step on from cellular automata to things called um, agent-based models. OK. So here we have some agents from the matrix, which have actually got nothing to do with agent-based models at all, but I thought it was a good photo. Um, so what's happening in an agent-based model is that the sort of cells which are interacting with their neighbors in a cellular automata, in an agent-based model, those things are actually allowed to move as well. They, they get their own kind of dynamics. Um, and they typically move under the action of these scary things called differential equations. Um, what's an agent-based model? Well, you identify agents, which could be biological cells, they could be people, they could be cities, okay? They could be companies, they could be all sorts of things. So uh, at different scales, you could have a city, in a city you could have a company, in a company you could have a person, in the person you had their cells. So you have different scales and different agents. Uh, you have a, a set of decision-making rules for each agent, so that's how they change their behaviour, um, they're allowed to learn as they do this, and they have to interact with their neighbours. So that's an agent-based model. Um, you often have many, many agents, you may have thousands of agents all interacting, um, and they typically obey these scary things called nonlinear differential equations. This is an agent-based model looking at education. In um, well, each of the agents in this case is a child in education. Um, so they're generally very hard, unlike the cellular automata, you can't solve them by hand. You need computers, often fairly heavy duty computers, because they're so big. Um, but what you try to do with an agent based model <clears throat> is you change the rules by which the agents interact, and you like to see whether you get collective behavior emerging from these different rule choices. 
So I'm, not, I'm going to give two examples um, to show how that works. Um, so these become very popular. There's a lot of work to be done on them, but I think it's a very promising and exciting area of mathematics. Um, and they're being used in, to understand biological systems, sociological things, uh, economics, and management, even management. Okay. Bearing in mind that human beings, by and large, do what they do rather than do what you tell them to do, but they're still proving useful. So I want to get on now to the kind of title of my talk, which is Can We Do Maths in the Crowd? Um, and one of the reasons I got interested in crowds was that I have spent part of my working life in Japan. And Japan is a wonderful country to go to if you want to study crowds. Uh, wonderful. In particular, I recommend Shibuya. So Shibuya has the honour or distinction of being the busiest metro station in the world. Um, the Japanese are very organised people. There is a viewing gallery that you can go up in and drink coffee and you can watch the crowds below. Okay. And this is me looking down on a thing called a scramble crossing where people are trying to cross uh, the crossing interacting with each other. So you've got people basically coming from here, interacting with people coming from there. Um, and they said to me, can you model a scramble crossing for us? Can you write down some mathematics? So I thought for a while and realised I could. So here's my attempt to model a scramble crossing. I have people here, and those people want to get over there. I have people here, and they want to go over there. That's what actually happens in a scramble crossing. And somewhere in the middle, they're going to meet. OK. So here's an agent-based model that I wrote with some of my students to simulate that. So here we are. They're starting to interact now, pushing their way through each other. And as they do that, what's interesting is they start forming up lines here. You get a certain amount of structure emerging from all these complicated interactions. So after that, they're much more organised than they were before. And if you look down on the scramble crossing, it sort of does that. People do actually organise themselves. So that's, I'll just do that. Hopefully I can do that once again, and we can just see it once again as they interact with each other. There we go. So I see each of these little circles is obeying a differential equation um, governed by its interactions with its neighbours. OK, so how do we do that? Well, the ABM for a crowd has people as the agents. And you then have to write down rules for how these people might behave. So we're going to write some qualitative rules. Um, so qualitatively, people in a crowd typically have some sort of objective. Oh, well, if, if, if the fire alarms went, we'd all want to get out of the building. OK, so that's our objective. Um, <clears throat> we're probably going to follow signage saying exit this way. So we have, we have that. Um, we can't walk through walls, although my son used to try this when he was small. Um, so that's a constraint. Um, we also have the constraint that we can't walk through people, but different people have different views about how close they want to get to a person and whether they're going to push them out of the way or not. So we have some rules there. Um, we've, we're generally in a crowd with our family or friends, so we might want to be close to them. And there's always going to be a degree of randomness in our movement, especially if people are panicking. Okay. So these are qualitative rules, but we can make this mathematical. Um, and this guy here, Dirk Helbing, is probably the world leader on this. He has an institute in Switzerland. Um, and he's come up with a thing called the social force model, which is a wonderful uh, model for crowds, um, where he basically says, if you're an agent in the crowd, you're subject to three forces. What we call a global intent, which is what you want to do. You want to go somewhere at a certain speed. A social force, uh, this one, which is how you interact with your neighbours, basically how much you're going to push against your neighbours. And a boundary force, which is how you interact with the boundary, that you can't go through it. Um, R here, Ri, is the position of the ith agent, the ith person. Vi is the velocity of the ith agent. And these are our three forces acting. OK, so um, that's our, our beginnings of the equation. Um, and then all the maths and fun comes in working out what these forces are. Um, this is uh, the global intent model. 
that's where you want to get somewhere, you want to get to a point pi, and you want to get there at a certain speed, vi star, um, but you can't get there because people are in the way, but that's still where you want to get to. Um, so that's the, the uh, global intent force. Uh, the social force, I'm not even going to try to write down, it's really very complicated, but that's where you build in things like your own personal space, how much of a hurry you're in, how aggressive you feel. You know, if, if you're in a panic situation, you may just push people out of the way and you can't give a damn. Um, my impression, I hope this isn't racist, is that people in Japan are happier being in crowds than people in other cultures, and, and, and that's things you can build in. Okay, and then you can do stuff. So these uh, ABMs are really useful. We can use them to test theories on crowd behavior, which allows us to make predictions. Uh, we can design things like sports stadia or London Underground or a pilgrimage and so on by using these models to see how people all flow around buildings or into trains and stuff. And we can also look at scenarios where a bomb's gone off or a fire's gone off to see how people might react without actually exposing them to any danger. So these are actually genuinely useful things. Um, let's give a, uh, some examples. So here's an example of red people here going through a corridor, blue people here, going through a corridor, how do they organize themselves? Well, this, again, we can see them interacting. Um, and what's interesting is that after a while, people form themselves into lanes. And that's actually what they do, if you try it. If you come out of a train, um, going through the tunnels, and people are coming the other way, you will find that you naturally organize yourselves into lanes. And that's just an immediate prediction. Um, Here's another one. This is where I have some red students in the lecture theatre trying to get out at the same time as some blue students are trying to get in. And uh, we did this simulation to help the design of the lecture theatre of the bath. Um, and off they go. Um, so these two start to have a chat over here. You can get emotionally involved with the dots if you want to. Uh, there they are having a chat over here. Uh, they're not sure they can get through. Uh, eventually, uh, oh, yes, I get, oh, no, and then they get through, and, and, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's worth showing again, you might like to pick your favourite dot, uh, um, watch them do this, so, um, we actually had a lot of fun with this, and, and it helped in the design of the, of the routes around my university when we did this, obviously we did it for rather more students than this, uh, but the same idea. There we go. You know, it's a surprisingly, you know, realistic, these sort of things. Um, um, I advertised when we looked at starlings, you can do the same for a flock, where well, you can. Um, the difference is that birds move in 3D rather than uh, uh, two dimensions, and uh, they have less of a global intent but are much more driven by local conditions. Um, here are three rules for flocking. Uh, you have what we call the local flock, which is how many birds you can see at one time, which may be a half a dozen or something. Um, and the rules are that you align your flight direction. This is where the three-dimensionality comes in with the local flock. You try to be with the local flock, but you don't want to be too close. And again, you can take all these, and just like with Helbing, you can turn them into mathematics and you can build in the effect of predators. Um, so here's, I'm going to indicate with a predator, there we are, there's a flock, and they all run away from the predator. Okay. Um, and the next one I'm going to, well, I'll repeat that. The next one I'll do is I'll show you a murmuration calculation where we look at starlings. Um, so this is a starling flock we're going to have a look at now. Here we go. Again, they're locally interacting, but forming these global patterns which really look like they're a one single organism interacting with each other. Again, it's doing the same sort of rules. This is an ABM with all of the agents. Okay. So, to conclude, my friend wants to model Dorset. How are we going to do it? Well, you identify the agents at these different scales, the general population, the tourists, the industry. You factor in the weather, the economy, Brexit, etc., etc. Um, you identify rules for interaction, and when you've spent about three years trying to figure all those out as an ABM, you like the blue touch paper. 
and stand back and hope something happens which is meaningful. So that, that's what we're going to do. Um, generally, some sort of modelling is better than nothing at all. Uh, it's debatable how true that is, but anyway, all I can say is, in a year's time, I might tell you how we've got on, because one of my next lectures in the next series is how do we model a human city? So watch this space. Thank you very much. Thank you.